Hello, this video is part of a series of videos on the real business cycle model and its implementation in Dynair. In this particular video, I will focus on simulating your model. Um, particularly, I will cover two different cases. First, deterministic simulations, that is models uh, under perfect foresight, and also stochastic simulations, that is simulations based on uh, local approximations of the policy functions. Of course, there are several other ways to simulate a DSG model, like the extended path, which you can do in Dynair, or some other approximation to technique, like global solution methods um, for the policy function approximations. I will cover these in other videos, but focus here only on the two most common approaches. If you find this video useful, or if you spot any mistakes, please let me know in the comment section, and I will update the description. Also check out my blog on more stuff uh, regarding DSG models and Dynair. Okay, now let us talk about simulations. And in Dynair you can basically do two types of simulations, uh, on the one hand deterministic ones and on the other one uh, stochastic ones. So let me first have a look at the deterministic model. So whenever you enter a mode file in Dynair, um, Dynair actually transforms your model into a very general model framework where the endogenous variables only have one lead and one lag. Okay, so only t minus one, t or t plus one variables. If you have a model with more leads and lags, then the preprocessor will actually take care of all the transformations needed. Now we have endogenous variables y, exogenous variables u and parameters theta. And our nonlinear model equations are denoted here with f. So typically we want to compute trajectories or for the variables or paths for the variables um, given the model equations, okay? So how does the model go from one equilibrium to another one? How, does the, how do the agents optimally react to temporary or permanent shocks to unexpected or pre-announced shocks? Um, and that is uh, shocks are here uh, a change in the exogenous variables. And note that there is no uncertainty here, okay? So this is in the deterministic model in the framework, agents have perfect foresight. They know the exact values of all the shocks. So in the stochastic case, we consider rational expectations models, okay? So because agents don't know all the values of the shocks, but they do form expectations about them. So they are aware of the probability distribution of the shocks, but there's uncertainty of the exact values of shocks in the future. Now, if we introduce a certain stochastic process for the exogenous variables, um, for instance, in Dynair, we take these to be Gaussian distributed, and we add the conditional expectation operator on our model equations. Okay, so this is the ET. So conditional on information available at period T, um, how do agents optimally react. And in the stochastic model, we focus on reaction functions or decision functions or so-called policy functions. That is given a previous state of the economy and the current value of the exogenous variables, how do agents optimally choose the current paths of their behavior today? And this is given by this function G, which is typically unknown. Okay, so what about the simulations part, uh, how does Dynair actually simulate these two different uh, model frameworks? Now Dynair computes the solution of deterministic models uh, up to an arbitrary precision. Because this boils down to solving a nonlinear system of simultaneous equations. And there are several algorithms developed for this case. There are uh, based on work of the original founder of Dynair, Michel Giard, but also on uh, papers by Lafargue and Bouchekin, um, and also much accelerated since then by um, another the team member of Dynair, by Mihubi. And basically the computational algorithms make use of a Newton-type um, solver, um, either with relaxation or exploiting the sparsity of the system uh, or the block, st block structure of the problem because some equations are recursive, uh, purely um, backward looking, others are static, um, etc. So there's a lot of fine tuning going on in the optimization, but actually we can solve for the paths of the endogenous variables with arbitrary precision, keeping all nonlinearities. And so this is basically also what other scientists do when they look at, at large climate models, for instance, uh, describing the behavior of the oceans or of the weather. So we can handle very large systems here. In the stochastic case, 
we focus on the decision well and, and actually we almost never know this in closed form and need to approximate it. Okay, um, and we can do so either globally, say we consider a large grid of values for the endogenous variables and then try to uh, approximate uh, the unknown function and try to fit coefficients of, of a function that best minimizes some objective. But this typically is computationally very expensive and we very quickly run into the so-called curse of dimensionality. Okay, so the grid grows and also the points we need to approximate the uh, integrals of the conditional expectations operator, um, this grows also uh, exponentially. So we can only do this for very small models. What we can do in Dynair though is local approximations using the perturbation technique. Because here we don't use a grid, but we only approximate in one point only, say the steady state. And the basic idea here is to use tail approximations of the model equations, evaluate these in steady state, and then use these expressions to compute tail approximations of the decision function g. This is the perturbation approach. Most of the times we do only first order approximations. This is also known in the literature as the solution to linear rational expectations model or log linearizing and solving your model. Um, this is all the same. And we use the first order because um, we get a very convenient linear state space system which makes simulations but also estimations um, very easy. But in Dynair you can also do higher order approximations if you want to. Then of course the computational problem becomes a bit more involved. Let me try to sum up again. In the deterministic case we compute trajectories of the variables numerically. We solve for paths and not decision rules. Okay, we, we use a Newton type method, we focus on um, initial conditions and terminal conditions and try to get good initial guesses for the values in between. So this is a two point boundary problem and we can do this in arbitrary precision. There's one little approximation happening because the convergence to uh, the terminal condition does not happen asymptotically but in finite time. On the other hand, the stochastic framework, the unknowns are the decision functions. Okay, and Dynair approximated decision rules and transition equations by a perturbation method. And of course, I'm not doing a right on the whole literature on solving these G models, but I think in this video, this, this is okay. Okay, so when do you use which framework? And the key difference between the stochastic and the deterministic models is the role of uncertainty. Okay, in a deterministic world, we have perfect knowledge about all the future events, uh, including all the policy actions. So given some initial data, we can then derive the optimal state and control paths, um, which lead then again back to the old steady state or, or into a new steady state. And this is done under fulfilling the objectives. So under, it will generate you the highest utility, generate the highest profits, okay? And on the other hand, in the stochastic setting, there's always some randomness involved, okay? So we do not necessarily know if or when a shock hits the economy. We can build expectations though, okay? So because we know the, the probability distribution of it. So the stochastic model here is more flexible, maybe more realistic because Typically the future is uncertain, but it does come at the cost of tractability. So deterministic models can be used if something happens that is completely certain and predictable. People, agents have perfect foresight and the model will give you an impression about the influence of this change, of this shock, the uh, behavior and anticipation of something happening. Uh, say you, you introduce a tax uh, or a new currency, so this is typically the, something that, that does not come unexpected, but is typically pre-announced so people can already start changing their behavior. So this is useful if you really care about the full implications of the non-linearities in your model. On the other hand, stochastic models are economically definitely more realistic as the future is uncertain. Shocks occur unexpected. Okay, so you have technological innovations, you have financial crises, you have uh, monetary policy shocks. As we consider models with rational expectations, the distribution of these shocks is known. 
to the agents, but not the exact values and not the timing of the shocks. So agents, what they can do is they can make only probability statements uh, and use this to derive optimal decision functions. And if you look at, at say, a first order approximation, agents only consider the expectation of a shock, which is zero by assumption. So agents, in a sense, behave if future shocks were equal to zero. And this is also what we call certainty equivalence. If you don't like that, and if you think that there is something like precautionary savings or risk premium that we need, that you want to study, then you can also do higher order approximations, which will make agents also uh, think about the uncertainty of the shocks. But the computational problem becomes more challenging here. So stochastic models are useful to study transmission mechanisms of stochastic shocks. So impulse response analysis is what we do here. Um, how important um, is the contribution of a monetary policy shock, a technological shock, a risk premium shock, etc for variability of the endogenous variables. So you can do a variance um, decomposition. So to sum up, um, whether or not you want to use the deterministic model uh, or the stochastic model depends on what you're studying, okay? So which kind of shock or policy experiment are you considering? How important is it for you to consider the full nonlinearities or the uncertainty in the model, okay? So this is a trade-off which you need to decide for yourselves. Let's have a look at deterministic sim simulations in Dynair, um, which commands are very useful for you. For here, for instance, we have blocks where we declare either the initial condition for the, the solver uh, in etval or the terminal condition for the solver and val, or we can define values out of steady state and see how it goes back to steady state with using, for instance, the histval block. Um, there is a shocks block where you can define the values for the exogenous variables. Again, in the deterministic model, people know when shocks happen and the exact value these shocks will have. And then you prepare the um, simulation with running the perfect foresight setup. Um, this will then create you several structures. And these are then used to run the optimizer um, by calling perfect foresight solver. There's still the simul command, which is uh, basically uh, an old syntax uh, for running both the perf perfect foresight setup and the perfect foresight solver at once. So when you enter these blocks, um, Dynair will generate you paths for the exogenous and endogenous variables and store it in the OO underscore endosimal and exosimal structures. And the perfect foresight setup command will initialize those matrices given the shocks, initval, endval, and histval blocks. And you actually have the constraints that the, the initial period and the terminal period, okay? Those are the constraints of the problem. And in between, you have the initial guess for the Newton algorithm. When you run perfect foresight solver, this will replace those initial values with the actual solution, okay? And running perfect foresight setup prior to perfect foresight solver is very handy because then you can ch double check whether the, the problem is exactly what you want to do or you can actually manipulate it to something that you want to achieve. Let me give you several examples in Dynair. Okay, now let's take the, the mode file I use in this video series for the RVC model with leisure and CES utility. And I will, um, for, for this tutorial, I will also modularize this mode file. So I will create a new script file called RBC nonlinear, let's call this common and use the ending. Actually, the ending does not really matter, but I, I like to use ink for include. And here I will put all the common code uh, lines that I will use for the simulations. Okay, so this is like declaring variables. Um, I'm using just a, ba just a random parameter calibration. I have other videos on, the, on calibrating the parameters here. The model equations and also the steady state model block. Okay. I don't need the steady command. Okay. Now let us do a first scenario. That is a temporary TFP shock under perfect foresight. 
Now, let us do a deterministic simulation. So I'm declaring a shocks block on the TFP shock. And in the first period, so periods is one, it's supposed to have some value, say minus 0 0.1. So this is a negative TFP shock. Now, before I actually do the simulation, I want to make sure that everything is set up accordingly. Remember the deterministic simulation is a basically a two point boundary problem. So basically you, you have to declare the uh, initial point you start in and the terminal point and some good guess for the values in between. And what I like to do is first let us set up the perfect foresight solver for just a few periods so we have a good overview and like those those blocks like shocks in it val and val hist val will fill those structures and let's have a look at those structures here now first oo underscore exo symbol so so just four periods okay and you have six rows here okay so this is basically the initial point this is t equals zero t equals one two three four and the terminal point Okay, so I'm only simulating four periods. So these are basically this and I want to to have this exogenous variable to be minus 0 0.1 in the first period. Okay, and that's that's okay. So the exogenous variables are set up correctly. What about the endogenous variables? Here we had rows for the time periods. Um, here we actually have columns for the time period. So this is t equals 0, t equals 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. And now for the, the, the Newton type optimizer, um, again, the two point boundary problem I want to solve is I have to give the initial value. So let's start in steady state and the terminal value. And as I'm just simulating one shock in period one, I want to start in the steady state in the current equilibrium and also end up in this. And in between, I have to provide some initial guesses. Okay, and uh, if I'm only using the shocks, command here and I'm computing here the steady state then all those are filled with the actual steady state which is I think a, f uh, a good initial guess. So th this looks like it's supposed to be. So let me comment this out and actually run the perfect foresight simulation. Okay. And here you have several options. The most important one is how many periods you want to simulate. Actually, we want convergence asymptotically, but the approximation the perfect foresight solver does is that we have convergence in finite time and what is finite here for me in 300 periods. So, and then I'm running the perfect foresight solver and this rplot command will simply plot the variables. Okay, now let's do this. Okay, now let's have a look. Model simulation, it was actually very quick to find the solution. All right, the perfect uh, foresight solution was found. And then we can see those plots here, plot of uh, output, consumption and investment um, over the 300 periods. Okay, so there was uh, one temporary shock that was unexpected and then how it gets back to steady state and actually gets back like, I don't know, maybe 40 periods it takes to get back to steady state. And let's have a look at technology. Okay, so there is uh, the steady state of TFP was one. Okay, it goes down by 0 0.1. So it starts here in the first period and it then goes back to steady state. Okay, so this, these are the, the so-called simulated trajectories. Now let's have a look at the workspace. What happened? You can see all the variables here are stored as vectors. And I'm simul my, my horizon is 300, but again, remember the initial period, uh, the initial values that I'm giving in is t equals zero, and the terminal value is uh, then uh, t e equals 301. So those vectors are uh, have 302 entries, okay? All right, so you can access those variables, you can plot them, you can maybe compute deviations from steady state, um, make nicer labels and stuff like that. Okay, good. Now let's have a look at the OO underscore structure. Okay, and here you can find um, 
again exo simul and endo simul. Now this is the actual um, perfect solution, uh, uh, perfect force. This is the actual perfect first solution that we computed. So in a sense, let's um, make a quick figure. Um, So the first row and the columns, so all time here, let's plot this. Yeah. Okay, so this is the data you can find in the OO underscore structure end of CMO. And this is actually the same data. This is the same data that you can find in Y. Okay, there you go. So you can quickly access the data here as well. Or it's stored also in the MAT file. All right. Now, exo this is also uh, uh, equivalently. And then we have a new structure here, OO underscore deterministic simulation which gives you some um, information about convergence uh, issues and how many itera iterations it took. And lastly, you have one more object, a uh, so-called D-series object. And um, if we have a look, this is more or less also just saving all the simulated data for all the variables, but it is a new class for MATLAB. So it has some built-in features that deal with all sorts, um, uh, with all things uh, re um, about time series. It is uh, basically uh, also devel developed by the Dynair team, mainly by Stefan. And I'm not covering this, but this is a very nice toolbox to uh, work with time series. So, okay, so this was basically one scenario, an unexpected shock in the deterministic model uh, that is under perfect foresight. And then you get all those simulations and what people tend to do is use their uh, own plotting uh, functions to get um, maybe um, deviations from steady state um, figures for um, some periods. Okay, now let's do another scenario that is a sequence of pre-announced shocks. So something happens, say, at period 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. And this is announced in period t equals 1. Now let me copy this over. And let's save this as... Okay, I want a pre-announced shock. Again, let's use a shocks block. We have on the exogenous variable. And I want this to happen at period 4, and 5, and 6, and 7, and 8. Or we can actually also do the preprocessor also understand stuff like this. So this will be 5, 6, 7, 8. And then I also have to declare values. Okay, so in say in period 4, I want this value to be 0 0.04. But in 5, 6, 7, 8, I want this to be a 0 0.01. Okay. One more, um, we always have to end the block. And one, maybe one more comment. Uh, you can, of course, also write this like this. Some people find this more, uh, find the overview better here. And Dynair will then use this value for period 4. But for those periods, it will then automatically expand this. Again, let's first check whether we are doing what we want to do. Okay, so let's do a perfect foresight setup. Of course, I'm doing here at least eight periods. Um, or maybe let's keep it like that. Let's see what happens. There should be an error. Yes, please check the declaration of shocks, increase the value of periods. Of course, I need at least eight periods. And again, very importantly, always double check whether um, the two boundary problems, so your the initial values you want to have and the terminal values are actually set the way you want them. So this is also why we came up with this new syntax that you first run perfect foresight setup 
and then you run perfect foresight solver. The old syntax was just use the simul command, which does both at once and this got a bit messy. So you're more flexible with this new syntax here. Okay, let us first have a look at the exogenous variables. Okay, so there will be one shock in, again, this is period t equals zero. This is one, two, three. All right, in four, the exogenous uh, shock will get this value and five, six, seven, eight, we have 0 0.01. This is exactly what I declared. What about my endogenous variables? Again, this is t equals zero. This is t equals one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And this is the terminal condition I want to end up with. Okay, and the, the variables here maybe are in declaration order. So this is the order you have in your symbolic declarations. Okay, and yes, I want to start at the steady state and I want to end at, at the steady state. Perfect. Looks good. So I can then go ahead and uncomment the actual simulation. Well, it took about a hundred. Maybe one more command. If you if you don't want to plot the whole three hundred here. You can do also, let's close everything, a so-called desample command, and let's just do 100 periods. So whatever comes next after the desample command will then be based only on 100 periods. Okay, so let's do this again. So, and here for TFP, you, um, you can actually see it that at period one, two, three, at four, something happened, okay, it got raised by zero point, um, 0 0.04 and then you have those increases by 0 0.1 and then it gets back to its steady state value. But you can now also see that because the shock is pre-announced and agents have a perfect foresight, they start changing their behavior immediately. Okay, let's do a third scenario, a permanent shock. Okay, so in period one, TFP increases permanently such that the new equilibrium of productivity level is supposed to be uh, 1.05. So TFP increases by 5%. And this is unexpected in period one. Okay, so let's create a mode file for this scenario. Okay, now I've copied the, the file. I've called this mode file RBC nonlinear the, the scenario three. And now I have a steady command here. Let us remove this steady command because I want to show you a bit um, about how the init val and the end val block actually work. So I want this permanent shock, I want a TFP to increase such that I am uh, I'll end up in a new steady state where the TFP uh, level is 1.05 instead of just one. Okay, and uh, I can do this with the init val command. So um, if I'm looking at my total factor productivity equation, so I want this value to be some such that this implies um, a, a new equilibrium where A is 5% higher or 1.05. So for this, we have the init val block where I want to start uh, basically with this uh, being equal to zero and then the end val. Okay, let us first simply run this. Okay. And you see some strange behavior here. Okay, let's see. You have the message failed to solve the perfect foresight model. You can actually see that here something happens. Okay, so this is uh, something's wrong here. And that is why I always advise to have a look how those uh, structures are actually set. Let's have a look. Okay, for my exogenous, this looks exactly what I want it to be. These are the shocks needed that in the end, I will have a, a higher steady state of uh, productivity. But now for the endogenous values, I have not specified any values for the init val command. Okay, so by default, Dynair assumes zeros. The terminal condition though, that is, my steady state. 
Okay, my steady state, but I actually build with apps A equals zero. So this is not what I want to do. And also I have a severe problem because when all those variables are zero, I cannot do log of zero, right? This is the, and this is a problem because in my model equations, I of course have log of zero. So many times uh, if you run into problems that the solver cannot find, check your initial and your terminal conditions if you have like um, the log function in there and whether or not you have any zeros in there, okay? So in a sense, I would need also to provide um, um, all other steady state values. And a neat little trick to do so is actually calling the steady command after the init val block and also calling the steady command after the end val block. Okay, let's do this. Ha, we get another error. The steady state file did not compute the steady state. I have, oh, total fa factor productivity is not high enough. Ah, of course. Let's have a look. I'm changing the value of apps A, okay? And here I'm telling Dynaeo that the steady state is always one. Well, actually it's not always one. Okay, so I need to adjust this, okay? No error. And let's have a look at the implied initial condition and terminal condition. So I'm starting at the old steady state. You can see it here. This is uh, TFP, okay? And I'm using the end val, since I'm calling end val here, as initial guess, I'm using actually the new steady state. You can see it here. Okay, and this looks good. And I want this to be a permanent shock. All right, so this looks good, and I can run the simulation. Okay, so here you can see the trajectory of, of the productivity level. Okay, it jumps and it keeps going then to the new steady state. And this of course has implications for all other variables. Now let's do a fourth scenario, um, basically the same, but let's do a pre-announced permanent shock. TFP increases in some later period. So let's copy this. Okay, let's do a pre-announced permanent shock. Basically, this is the same scenario, but we have a different timing because the shock is supposed to start only at period, say, six or something. Okay, and we can do this by including a shocks block. Okay, so for the first five periods, we actually set the shock to zero. So this is a pretty announced permanent shock. Let's check whether this is what we want to achieve. Yeah, okay, one, two, so the zero, one, two, three, four, five. Ah, starting with period six, we get this increase, this permanent increase, and we start at the old steady state, we will end up at the new equilibrium and as initial guess, we have used the end val for the Newton solver. Now the Newton solver will compute the perfect foresight solution. Okay, so you can see here, it starts at period in period six, but agents already start changing their behavior. Okay, as uh, the last scenario I want to consider in the deterministic case is a um, return to equilibrium. Say uh, we start at a point where the steady state capital stock is below its steady state level. So first let us see what is actually with this calibration, what is um, the steady state capital stock. So let's compute the steady here. Uh, something around 12.53. So now I want to start below. And for this we have a hist val command where you can actually select the historical values, okay? And you can even go back, uh, if you have models with more lags, then you would need to also maybe add um, values for those lagged variables as well. So in period T, I want to start at 10. Let's just run this and let's see what, what happens. 
I'm getting again an error. Okay, so we already saw that this inf tells you that um, the solver tries to compute the logarithm of zero. So again, it is always good practice to have a look at what you're doing. Let's first have a look here. There it is. Okay, so my initial condition, I want capital to be 10, right? But like for the initial guess for the other values, I'm using zero and the logarithm of zero does not work. So actually I do have to provide more values, say this was supposed to be the old steady state. Okay, this looks good. And there we go. Okay, so technology does not change, but so the steady state is basically 12 point something and we start at a low value and this is the trajectory how we get back. Yeah, so we need to invest, therefore the interest rate goes up. Um, okay, you can see that we invest more, etc. Now, what about stochastic simulation in Dynair? Um, here, basically, you only have to care about two commands. The shocks block, which has a, a bit of a different syntax because in the shocks block, you only declare the covariance matrix of your shocks. You can also consider correlated shocks, but um, be careful about the order you do declare shocks because uh, for um, simulations, computations, we rely on a Cholesky decomposition. So similar what you see structural VR models um, with the Cholesky decomposition there. Okay, and then there's the stock Zemol command, which will then actually perform the approximation of the policy function and um, imports response function analysis or simulation of your data. Okay, and um, there are several options that are um, important that you can change. For instance, which order of approximation are you using for the perturbation approximation of the policy functions? Um, the IRF command, um, if you set this to a certain horizon, will then compute you impulse response function. Then there's also the periods command. If you set this to zero, then Dynair is able to compute uh, theoretical moments and theoretical variance decompositions. Now, if you set the periods to something other than zero, then this will compute one or several simulations by drawing random shocks. The moments and the variance decomposition is actually based on the empirical uh, moments and um, variance decompositions there. So if you want to focus your analysis on just a few variables, say YC and IV, then you can simply write them here um, before ending the command with a semicolon. Still, Dynair computes the decision rules and simulations for all variables, but the plots and the display in the, in the console will only be for these three variables there. Okay, now let us also do this in Dynair. Okay, now let us do a stochastic simulation, a stochastic shock. Okay, let's do a unexpected TFP shock. So you have a shocks block where you specify the variance and covariance of the shock. And then you're running the stochsimul command. Um, and here I just want to compute impulse response functions for 30 periods and I want to have um, theoretical moments and I'm focusing only on those three variables. Okay, so let's run this and there are your impulse response functions. Okay, but maybe let's add A as well. So the standard error of the shock is 0 0.04 and this will do a one standard deviation shock in the impact on impact in the period zero and the impulse response function here is the trajectory of the variables minus their steady state value. So this, uh, you will then see at some point it will return to steady state and this is always then the, the zero line here. Okay, now um, let us simply add a uh, discount factor shock here. So we have uh, one more shock for this. I'm simply opening up the common file. I will copy this into a new file. Let's call this RBC nonlinear common 
1.ink and I'm adding a new variable set. This will be a discount, a preference shifter on the discount factor. So basically the utility function is multiplied with a shifter, this variable z. Then I want to add a new uh, shock. Let's call this apps z. Um, I want this to be also AR1, so I need one more parameter. Let's make this 0 0.5. And this new shock um, is has an impact on the marginal utility. So this is plus one minus z times z times z plus one times. Okay, and I need, of course, one more equation for this. Okay, and due to the luck here, this is just one. And I would actually need to adapt these also for the Z variable, but as this is one, this does not matter in this case. Okay, now let's do a second simulation, okay, where we include common one. Okay, so let's put in some variants here. And let's see also of that. Okay, so I have two shocks now in the model and both have a non-zero variance. Okay, and then the pulse response analysis is now for each shock individually. Okay, so here you have the impulse response function for apps A, and here you have the impulse response function for apps Z. Okay. Let us now have a look at what happens in the terminal here. Okay, so you will get a model summary, you will have an overview of the covariance matrix of the shocks you declared, and here are approximated policy and transition functions. Okay, so these are actually the coefficients of the approximated policy function. Because we said periods equals to zero, you will get theoretical moments here and also a variance decomposition. Okay, how important are the individual um, variances of the shocks for the variance of the variables? And matrix correlation, matrix of autocorrelation for the variables you selected after writing it. Uh, after ending the Stoxemon command. If you don't write down any variables here, it will plot everything for all variables. Okay, now let's have a look in the OO underscore structure. And you will have a couple of things here, okay? So let's uh, see here, the impulse response functions are saved. They are actually also in the workspace, okay? So this is how A behaves to a shock on impact on of apps A. 30 periods, so you can um, access those variables already in the workspace, or they are also saved in this OO underscore IRF structure. The autocorrelations um, that are printed to the console uh, uh, here, the variance decomposition, the variance, the mean, and this is also the uh, variance and autocovariances, auto another structure for this. Um, and another important one is OO underscore DR, which um, has the coefficients of the approximated policy functions. So if you see OODRGHX, so those are the coefficients that you find. Let me rerun this quickly. So for instance, for investment here, you have these coefficients here. And if you have a look at the third entry here, these are the uh, coefficients with respect to the state variables and these are the coefficients with respect to the, to the two shocks. Then you have some intermediate results of the um, perturbation approximation um, like eigenvalues etc. Uh, those are the state variables of your model if you need to index these and the steady state in dr order and two 
indices where you can switch between the declaration order and the R order. So Dynera makes a distinction between the declaration order, which is the order of variables, uh, the way you declare them in the mode file. And uh, so for instance, have a look here at investment is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the eighth variable, but the coefficients for investment are actually in the fourth row. So Dynair has a certain so-called DR decision rule order where the variables get reshuffled. So first come static variables, then we have purely uh, predetermined variables, then we have mixed um, predetermined and uh, current vari variables, then you have uh, mixed forward and forward-looking variables, then you have purely forward-looking vari variables. So this is the reshuffling that happens and you can do that uh, so for instance, let's, this is the, in declaration order, but we can put this in the R order. Okay, so for instance, investment is in the fourth row. Now let's not do an IRF analysis, but let's simulate for 300 periods. Let's clear the workspace here. Okay, let's have a look again. The policy and transition functions are the same, of course, right? But then Dynair simulates data. So it draws 300 values for shocks randomly, and then it computes moments and variance compositions, etc. Okay, so those are then the moments of the simulated variables. Looking in the workspace, variables here, which are then the simulated value values. Okay, so if we do plot, I don't know why, Okay, so there you have simulated data uh, by drawing randomly 300 shock values and then simulating using the policy function. Okay, that's it. Please leave your comments below. I will also update the description um, in the, of the video if I made any mistakes here. In the next videos of the series, I will cover other topics like how to linearize or log linearize uh, the model and should you really do that. Uh, how to estimate the parameters with either full information methods like maximum likelihood or Bayesian MCMC methods or limited information methods uh, like GMM or SMM. And we will also look at different variants of the models and the implications or the lessons learned from the RBC model. The overall goal of this uh, little video series is to uh, teach about the um, toolboxes and neat little things Dynair offers you and hopefully this makes uh, working with these G model easier and more elegant. Thank you.